Hello there, everybody, boys and girls. Welcome back to ITTV. For today's lesson, let's look at the body defense mechanism and immunity. So we're basically focusing on the body defense mechanism and immunity. The learning outcomes for today will be to state another function of the circulatory system besides just on transportation, to identify the body's three lines of defense mechanism, to describe the process of phagocytosis, to state the meaning of antigen and antibody, and to state the meaning of immunity and immunization. So with that, we, in addition, we have to relate antigen and antibody to immunity. We need to know how to name and give examples of various types of immunity. By the end of the lesson, students should be able to state the effects of HIV on the body's defense mechanisms, to describe the transmission of HIV, and to suggest ways to prevent the spread of the acquired immune deficiency syndrome known as AIDS. So, let us look at the role of the circulatory system in the body's defense system. Because we have learned the circulatory system in fish, amphibians and humans, and we have compared the different circulatory systems. So today, we will continue with other roles of the circulatory system apart from in transport. You see, there are many microorganisms in our environment, in which some of them are pathogenic. And humans are always attacked by diseases caused by microorganisms or pathogens which are transmitted via air, contaminated water or food and also by vectors such as mosquitoes and flies. Some skin diseases can also be transmitted via contact. So a healthy body is needed to be protected from these pathogens. Some skin diseases, for example, maybe leprosy, um, you have hand, foot, mouth disease, which is transmitted via contact. So it is very important for us to have a healthy immune system to protect ourselves from these harmful pathogens. Generally, in the human body, there are three lines of body defense mechanisms, which are the first line of defense will be the skin through sweat and sebum through mucous membranes which will secrete mucus and the second line of defense will be a process called phagocytosis by phagocytes and the third line of defense would be antibodies by lymphocytes so let us look at the first line of defense which is our skin now the skin is the body's physical barrier it is a tough outer layer made up of dead keratinized layer and acts as effective barrier against entry of microorganisms. So that is obviously our first line of defense because our skin covers us from head to toe. So it is our first line against harmful microorganisms like bacteria, viruses and parasites. And you can see a picture of our skin. So example, when there is a cut, the blood clotting mechanism becomes activated to protect the wound so that there is no entry of microorganisms into the body through the wound. And we have looked at the previous lessons that the blood clotting mechanism is vital to prevent a serious loss of blood. Besides that, our first line of defense, besides being the skin, there is also mucous membranes. But apart from that, we have lysozymes, which are contained in tears of tear glands. And acidic sebum of sebaceous glands are also secreted to destroy bacteria. Did you know that the oil from our face can also um, you know, be there to destroy bacteria? It definitely has an important function. Now, and if you refer to the diagram of the mucous membrane, because the mucous membrane refers to cells lining the respiratory tract, openings of urinary and reproductive systems. The membrane secretes a protective layer of mucus which is very sticky. So if you refer to the diagram back again, that we have mucous membrane lining our respiratory tract from 
the you know from the pharynx to the trachea bronchi bronchiole and the lungs and this is still considered first line of defense now besides mucous membrane lining the respiratory tract and the reproductive system we also have mucous membrane lining the digestive tract as well from the mouth to the pharynx to the to the esophagus to the stomach you know pancreas small intestine large intestine rectum and anus all of that we have mucous membranes and now example let's look at an example of how mucous membrane plays its role in first line of defense firstly mucus secreted in nasal cavity so that the trachea can trap dust particles and bacterial spores cilia then sweep the particles to the pharynx where they are swallowed hydrochloric acid in the gastric juices destroy microorganisms which enter the stomach so as you can see the mucous membrane is our first line of defense because it lines the respiratory tract, digestive tract, reproductive tract, as well as the urinary tract, because it secretes a lot of mucus to help just to help trap dust particles, spores from bacteria, which are potentially um, detrimental to our health. And we have cilia as well, lining especially the respiratory tract to sweep all these particles to the pharynx where we swallow it and then we have the hydrochloric acid in our stomach to help to digest um, you know to destroy the microorganisms which have entered the stomach now so there was first line of defense which is basically skin mucous membrane lysozymes and tears let's move on to our second line of defense what happens if the microorganisms have passed they have managed to evade the first line of defense what is our second line of defense? This deals with pathogens that have passed the first line of defense. It involves phagocytic white blood cells such as neutrophils and macrophages. Phagocytes are cells that can easily engulf and digest pathogens. Infection causes the number of white blood cells to increase so that they're able to destroy the pathogen. So generally, when the pathogens have managed to cross the first barrier, then out comes our second line of defense in the, in the form of phagocyte cells, example, neutrophils and macrophages. They actually um, you know, engulf and eat up the microorganisms through a process called phagocytosis. So when our body has an infection like um, you know, lung infection, actually it is a way that uh, all the white blood cells are being generated to try to destroy all these harmful pathogens. So our immune system is actually like an army of soldiers trying to battle it out in the battleground. And sometimes phagocytes sadly can also be destroyed by toxins that are produced by the pathogens. That's why sometimes in infections, sometimes the body will, will actually fail the, you know, the defense because perhaps the toxins and the poisons that are released by the pathogens are much, so much more, it overwhelms the second line of defense. And that is where sometimes the third line of defense has to come in. But before that, I'm sure you're interested to know how the process of phagocytosis happens. So let us have a look in detail at phagocytosis. Phagocytes, which are the white blood cells, are attracted to chemicals produced at the infection site by the bacteria. Phagocytes then move towards the bacteria and extends its pseudopodia to engulf it to form phagocytic vacuole. And hydrolytic enzymes are secreted into the vacuole to digest the bacteria products of digestion are absorbed into the phagocyte. So generally, phagocytosis is a process to destroy invaded pathogens, pathogens that have actually crossed the first line of defense. All right? So phagocytosis destroys these pathogens by which phagocytes will move towards the pathogens and just engulf them. So it's like, it's like basically they're eating the pathogens because they engulf them and then they will actually produce certain enzymes to digest them and then they eat it up. They, 
you know, the digested products of the pathogen are reabsorbed to, to strengthen perhaps the phagocyte. So generally, if you refer to the diagram, it's all displayed there, how phagocytosis actually takes place. Pseudo means fake and pseudopodium. Pseudopodium means fake legs. So the phagocytes will be attracted to the chemicals produced at the infection site and they will produce fake legs to engulf the phagocyte and a vacuole will be, will be actually produced at the site of engulfment. So it's really wonderful how phagocytosis can actually, you know, help to destroy these pathogens that have successfully crossed the first line of defence. Now let's look at the third line of defence. Now this takes over if pathogens pass the first and second line of defence in which lymphocytes are involved. Lymphocytes are found in lymph nodes and blood circulatory system and they are divided into two. We have the T lymphocytes that attack infected cells and coordinate immune response and we have the B lymphocytes that produce antibodies. So generally, if the skin mucous membrane fails, we have the phagocytes. If phagocytes fail, our last attempt will be to give out the lymphocytes. There are two types of lymphocytes, the B and the T lymphocytes. Now, lymphocytes are special cells of the lymphatic system and they provide specific immunity. Lymphocytes, they originate in the bone marrow. From the bone marrow, they will migrate to the lymph nodes, which, you know, which are scattered throughout the body along the lymph vessels. So the lymphocytes um, actually will stay in the lymph nodes and in the lymph nodes, they will mature and multiply. So basically, let's look at the antibodies which are produced by the B lymphocytes. Antibodies are proteins produced by B lymphocytes which interact with the antigen and make them harmless. And each type of antibody interact with one specific antigen only. So let me show you a picture of the antibody. Now generally, antibodies have a special Y shape. Okay? And um, the, the interaction of antibody and antigen is very specific. Because usually pathogens and microorganisms, they would have all these proteins on their surface, these antigens on the surface. And so, these antigens on the surface of the microbe or the pathogen. So this is a really virulent, harmful microbe that has crossed the first and the second line of defence. And every microbe will have their specific antigens around it, which are basically proteins. So this is an antibody. And um, the antibodies will recognise specific antigens and will either bind to it and of course neutralise the antigen. So different antibodies have different lines of action and the action of antibodies are specific. One type of antibody for a specific type of antigen. It's something like an enzyme-substrate interaction. Every enzyme is specific for a substrate. So every antibody is specific for its particular antigen. So if we look at it, antibodies are also highly specific and they destroy antigens in different ways. Antigens are foreign substances found on the surface of cells that stimulate immune response or formation of antibodies. So um, the cells could be like pathogens or they could even be toxic substances, certain poisons which we categorize as antigens which are recognized by specific types of antibodies. So different antigens have different types of antibodies. So, as you recall, antibodies are so, so specific. Now, let us look at this diagram. 
The diagram shows mechanisms involved to destroy antigens via antibody-antigen interaction. Let's look at the first, um, the first interaction, the first mechanism, which we call neutralization. In neutralization, the antibody blocks viral attachment sites or they coat bacterial toxins, making them ineffective to infect a host cell. So, when antibodies bind to antigen, they inactivate antigen by three general methods. The neutralization method, as you can notice, you see the Y-shaped antibodies that they actually coat or bind to the certain attachment sites and they make them ineffective to infect a host cell. The host cell would be our normal cells. The second mechanism that antibodies inactivate antigen is through a process called agglutination. This agglutination of antigen-bearing particles such as microbes. As you can see, after agglutination, this would all enhance phagocytosis. All these three different methods actually enhance phagocytosis. And the last method is the method of precipitation. Okay, what happens is that antibodies bind to soluble antigens causing them to precipitate. And these immobile precipitates are easily engulfed by phagocytes. So precipitation means to draw out from solution, make them into solid. So the antibodies have actually caused the antigens to solidify, to precipitate, to coagulate together. And do you know how agglutination actually works? All right. Well, basically, if, uh, if you're not too sure about what agglutination means, going back to the second mechanism, antibody-mediated agglutination of bacteria and viruses, they'll form aggregates that makes it simpler. So agglutination is like an aggregation, aggregation that all will allow the phagocytes to easily engulf this mass. So neutralization, agglutination, precipitation of all these antigens allows phagocytosis to be easier. It allows um, the, you know, the phagocytes to easily engulf all these precipitates. So, those were the three major mechanisms of action by antibodies. Neutralization, agglutination and precipitation, which enables phagocytosis easier to happen. Well, so that was all about antibodies, the mechanism of action produced by B lymphocytes. Let us look at something different called memory cells. Now, there are also memory cells which are the lymphocytes that stay for several years or months after a particle infection so that the body is defended against further infection by the same antigen. Now, so thereby we come to, you know, something different. Because most of us would have chicken pox or measles or mums during our young age. If we realize we would not get the disease for the second time, we wouldn't get chicken pox the second time if we had gotten in earlier before. So, so why is that? You know, this is because of something marvelous called immunity in our body. Now, let's look at this flow chart. It shows different types of immunity, right? So, as you can see, immunity is divided into active and passive immunity. And to attain either active or passive immunity, there are both natural and artificial ways of acquiring immunity. So, you know, this flowchart really beautifully describes different types of immunity that we can possess. Which, let us look at it in detail. Now, immunity is the ability of the body to resist infection by pathogens. And it relies on lymphocytes and the antibodies produced to give a specific immune response. 
as you all saw in the flow chart, immunity is divided into active immunity and passive immunity. Active immunity occurs when an individual's own immune system produces its own antibodies to defend against specific antigens. While active natural acquired immunity occurs when an individual has recovered from certain diseases like mumps, chicken pox, measles. I'm sure you remember if you ever had this disease when you were young, but you will never have it again. It is because of active natural acquired immunity. Because active immunity is that your body naturally will actively produce its own antibodies to defend itself against pathogens. So the active natural immunity is when you have acquired your own natural immunity after you have been infected once before. Now, the body has the ability to produce antibodies to fight against the same antigen when attacked again. That is why we will never get chickenpox again if we had gotten it um, much earlier because our body would have already produced the army of antibodies to recognize the chickenpox antigen. Now, let us look at this graph. So, this graph shows you antibody concentration versus time. And active immunity occurs when an individual's own immune system produces its own antibodies to defend against specific antigens. And if you notice, the body has the ability to produce antibodies to fight against the same antigen when attacked again. So when a person is exposed to an antigen for the first time, there is a lag of several days before a specific antibody becomes detectable. Right? So, then after a second exposure to the same antigen, there is something we call a secondary immune response. Whereas, if we are first exposed, the first time exposed to antigen B, it also needs a lag of several days before a specific antibody becomes detectable, as you can see from the graph. That antibodies to B are only produced after a few days after exposure to a certain antigen. Now, let us look at active artificial acquired immunity. Now, this is established upon vaccination. When vaccine which contains killed or weakened antigens is injected into the body, lymphocytes produce antibodies to fight against these antigens. This immunity can be carried out orally or by injection. Boosters, which are the subsequent same vaccines given, are to stimulate a quicker and an immune response that can last for a longer duration. Now, do you know who was the person who came up with the idea of vaccination? Because vaccination is a type of active but artificial acquired immunity because the body still produces its own antibodies by its own, but it's artificially um, it's artificially um, obtained through vaccination, which can be given through injection or through oral doses. Now, the person who came up with vaccination, yes, I heard that some of you might know it, is Sir Edward Jenner. He, he was born in 1749 and he lived till 1823. Basically, he produced vaccine from cowpox produce immunity against smallpox in a child's body and that was a success. So that's why smallpox is no longer existent in this world. It's totally eradicated from this world. But back then, <clears throat> a lot of people died from smallpox when vaccinations weren't even produced. So vaccines either contain weakened or killed form of the antigen to stimulate the body's own immune response to produce its own antibodies to fight and to recognize this antigen so that the next time with the second with the exposure of this antigen the body would already have its own army of antibodies to fight against this antigen but this is not true exposure to the antigen but it is true vaccination 
which is either through a weakened or killed form of an antigen. So it's actually a brilliant way to actually stimulate the body to produce its own antibodies to recognize an antigen. So if you refer to this graph, with the first injection, the body will naturally produce a certain level of antibody over the span of a few weeks. It peaks at the third week and it starts to drop after that. So that's why certain vaccines have to be given again, like two, three doses, which we call boosters. So boosters are the same vaccines which are given basically to stimulate a quicker immune response and you can see that the antibody levels actually last a much higher and longer period of time. So that's why boosters are so important. So parents must not forget to vaccinate their child that one vaccine sometimes is not enough. You need to have a few boosters to actually um, maintain a, a high level of antibodies in our blood and to last for a longer period of time. Now, let's look at passive immunity. We have looked at active immunity which can be acquired through natural or artificial means. But passive immunity occurs when an individual is given the antibodies needed to defend against the pathogen. We have passive natural immunity which happens when antibodies produced by the mother is passed across placenta to fetus or through breastfeeding because colostrum contains antibodies. Not even colostrum, but even breast milk itself contains certain antibodies which, which are useful for the baby to fight against pathogens and infection because the baby's immune system is still very poor and very weak. So why do you call it passive immunity? Because the body doesn't produce its own horde, its own army of antibodies, but it's given. The antibodies are given to the person, so it's passive. You know, the person doesn't have to generate its own antibodies. And natural immunity is, of course, from mother to child, or from breast milk or colostrum to the mother, to the, to the baby. So, let's look at passive artificial immunity. This is achieved when ready-made antibody or anti-serum is injected into individuals' body who are badly sick. This produces a fast immunity, but only for temporary reasons. Example, anti-venom injection to treat snake bites. So actually, this is still passive in immunity because antibodies or anti-serum is given to the person. But this is given not when the person is healthy, but when the person is, you know, really dying or really badly infected and they need antibodies fast because they don't they don't have the luxury to wait for a few days or weeks for the antibody level to rise besides they are so sick that their body cannot generate any antibodies um, in a sufficient good dose to fight against the pathogens so this um, anti-venom for example is given to a person of course it's fast but it's only temporary as foreign antibodies injected are broken down easily after their lifespan and they're not replaced. Okay, because these are, these are given, for example, to treat snake bites, rabies, botulism, and even tetanus. It's an instant fast cure. But antibodies, they are proteins and they are broken down and they are not replaced for passive artificial immunity. So if you look at this, Passive artificial immunity to reinforce your understanding is achieved when a ready-made antibody or antiserum is injected into an individual's body. So the first injection, for example, is given in the first week. And the concentration of antibodies increase immediately and exceeds the level of immunity. But it drops down so fast. It, it, just, it just decreases so fast. Um, by the third week, it has actually dropped to, you know, the, below the level of immunity. And that's why a second injection has to be given in the fourth week to again drastically increase the concentration of antibodies. So the concentration of antibodies will um, increase again very fast and then they will start to decrease just within one week because antibodies break down and they are not replaced. Moving on, 
So we looked at different types of immunity, we looked at how the body actually responds, first, second, third line of defense against pathogens. Now let's look at um, the other learning outcome for today's lesson, which would be on HIV and AIDS. Now AIDS stands for Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome which is a disorder which damages the human's immune system and it is caused by the human immunodeficiency virus also known as HIV. I'm sure you have heard about AIDS. It's a scary word as it can cause death as other dangerous diseases like cancer, you know, heart attack, stroke. Currently, according to UN AIDS, there are about 42 million people around the world who are suffering from this disease. Can you imagine that? 42 million people, that's a big number. And it is very important for us to overcome this disease as there is no cure. I mean, imagine with all this latest technology and medical breakthroughs, we still have not found a cure for cancer or even AIDS. It's such a terrible, debilitating disease. Now, why is that so? Let us have a look at why HIV is, is, is you know, such a debilitating disease. HIV virus infects helper T cells, which has the ability to activate and direct other lymphocytes for the immune response against diseases in the body. HIV also attacks the central nervous system. It remains dormant for many years before showing the symptoms as it needs a long incubation period. Now, do you remember the T lymphocytes? They are the ones that coordinate the immune response of other cells. So because of that, they are so important if they are down because, you see, these T lymphocytes or T cells, they are the third line of defense. If they are gone, then there is no more. We, we don't have a fourth line of defense. It's only one, two, three. And once the pathogens are able to cross over the third line of defense by, by, you know, by actually killing and infecting our precious T cells, then our body will not be able to um, defeat the HIV virus. So, a person who is infected with HIV, as time goes by, the person becomes weak and the immune system is unable to fight against many pathogens. The function of the nervous system decreases and the individual will also experience drastic weight loss. So as you can see, people who die from AIDS, they don't die from um, you know, really, really um, terrible disease, but it's because the immune system is so weak that even sometimes simple diseases which a normal person can, can actually overcome, they actually, the body succumbs to it. Things like meningitis, pneumonia, even flu, they can actually die from flu because the immune system is so weak. All the T cells, T lymphocytes are all actually infected already. Because the virus is like a parasite, it needs whole cells to rapidly you know, um, divide and multiply. It needs whole cells to thrive. And that's why they actually start to kill all our T cells and thereby decreasing the function of our central nervous system. The cause of death of the individual will not be AIDS, but caused by other secondary infections that result due to low immune response by the body. Examples of disease are pneumonia, tuberculosis, meningitis, fungal diseases and cancer, such as Kaposi's sarcoma. So if you notice, a person with HIV does not die from AIDS, but secondary infections. Normal infections, which I mentioned just now, which normal people like you and I, we can easily overcome because our immune, fu immune systems are functioning well and healthy. But for a person with HIV, their immune systems are compromised. They have immunocompromised um, immune systems. So because of that, they can easily die just from diseases which we normally are able to overcome the infection. Even things like fungal diseases, it actually um, can kill a person with HIV. So let us look at um, a picture of this uh, HIV virus. As you can see here, it, um, it looks like a circular shaped virus and it has all these um, antigens surrounding it. These are all the certain special protein structures okay, that actually um, defines a HIV virus. And 
Uh, HIV virus is known as a retrovirus because it contains RNA in, inside the, the nucleus. HIV can only survive in body fluids like semen, vaginal fluids and blood. It can be transmitted in four different ways, which would be the virus can be transmitted via um, unprotected sexual intercourse with infected partners. An infected pregnant mother can transmit the virus to a child in the uterus and also through breastfeeding. A drug addict who is a HIV carrier that shares needles and syringes which are not sterile can pass the virus to another drug addict. Besides that, through contact uh, with blood products of an infected person, like in hospitals. So I think one of the saddest ways for HIV transmission is through um, blood transfusion. That if the hospitals does not screen or makes a mistake in the screening of blood that they miss out the presence of HIV virus and they just transfuse the blood to an innocent person. That person who receives the blood that is infected with HIV virus will be infected with HIV as well. And it's really sad because HIV has got no cure up to today. As there is no cure yet, many researchers are, are you know, trying to find ways, drugs, vaccines at least, to treat AIDS patients. Maybe to alleviate the, the pain they may be feeling. Maybe to boost up their immune system through different ways. So this disease cannot be transmitted by sharing food, public utensils, you know, through touch, through swimming pools, through public toilets. These are common misconceptions that people may have about the method of transmission of HIV virus. For now, the best way to overcome AIDS is through preventive measures. And what are the preventive measures that one can do to um, prevent from being infected with HIV. Firstly, do not engage in intercourse with more than one partner. To practice safe sex by using condom. Some countries even reduce sharing needles and syringes among drug addicts by setting up centres that allow free sterile needles and syringes exchange. Of course, the best is of course if they were to kick the drug addiction. And of course, we have drug rehabilitation centres. But for drug addicts which are so hardcore into the system, some governments and countries around the world, they actually set up special centres to just provide um, free sterile needles. Like the Malaysian AIDS Council as well, do give out free condoms as well to people so that you know that they will always practice safe sex. Of course, the best is the best is not to have um, not to actually um, you know, have intercourse before marriage because that will actually increase the rates of uh, possibility of HIV transmission. To not actually have intercourse before marriage but to only uh, you know, have it after marriage. Now, besides that, it is important to practice strict screening of blood before transfusion is made in hospitals. Apart from that, campaigns should be carried out to alert the public about the threat of AIDS to human health. And lastly, counselling should be provided to patients who are HIV positive to create the awareness of the virus and its spreading to other healthy individuals. So of course, naturally, it is the responsibility of the hospitals to screen carefully the presence of certain virulent, dangerous viruses and bacteria in the blood before they actually carry out blood transfusion. And of course, knowledge and information about um, the methods of transmission of HIV is crucial to actually um, prevent the transmission. And of course, for those like for example in Africa, most of the 42 million of HIV infected patients are actually based in South Africa. So, with all these HIV infected patients, important education and knowledge and, and you know, counselling should be given to them to educate them how not to actually spread HIV infection to other people because some of them are unaware, they're ignorant about the methods of transmission of HIV. So, with knowledge is power.
Okay, let's look at our question for today. Which of these is not true about the first line of defense? A. Skin is a tough outer layer that acts as effective barrier against entry of microorganisms. B. Antibodies are proteins produced by B lymphocytes, which interact with the antigens and make them harmless. C. Lysozymes containing tears and acid sebum are also secreted to destroy bacteria. D. When there's a cut, blood clotting mechanism becomes activated to protect the wound. So, what do you think is the answer for this question? Not true meaning what is false about the first line of defense? It's a tricky question. Now, actually if you look at it, if you scan true, all the statements are true. But, you need to answer what the question wants. The question is what is false about first? First line of defense. If you recall, first line of defense was skin. So skin is a tough outer layer that acts as effective barrier against entry of microbes. That's definitely true. But antibodies, they are not first line of defense. Antibodies are third line of defense. Antibodies are produced by B lymphocytes which interact with antigens via neutralization, precipitation, agglutination to enable phagocytosis to be easier, making pathogens harmless. Now the statement itself is correct, it's true, but it doesn't answer the question. This is not a first line of defense. So the answer is option B. Surely options C and D are true, which would be lysozymes and the blood clotting mechanisms are the first line of defense. Now, let us look at this question. The graph below describes dash. Okay, what does this graph talk about? A. When a person is exposed to an antigen for the first time, antibody becomes detectable very fast. B. If the person is re-exposed to the same antigen, a new antibody is produced. C. When a person is exposed to an antigen for the first time, antibody is produced in large amount. D. If a person is re-exposed to a new antigen for the first time, another immune response is triggered. Now, I would like you to study this graph and do think of the options as well. Now, if you look carefully at this graph, alright, let's look at the option. Option A. Um, when a person is exposed to an antigen for the first time, antibody becomes detectable very fast. Is that true? Let's look at the graph. First exposure to antigen A. As you can see, it takes 7 days and up to 14 days for peak amount of antibodies to antigen A to be produced. Because antigen A was introduced like for example the first day. And the production of antibodies is very slow. It takes up to maybe 16 days for a maximum level of antibodies to be produced. So it's not A. B. If the person is re-exposed to the same antigen, how can a new antibody be produced? If you are following the theory, if a person is re-exposed to second antigen, as you can see from the graph, second exposure to antigen A, but first exposure to antigen B, you would have a secondary immune response to antigen A. And you definitely do not have antibodies to B yet. Because um, for this one, if a person is re-exposed to the same antigen, the same antibody is produced but with greater amounts and of course a bit faster, a bit faster and greater amounts. C. When a person is exposed to an antigen for the first time, antibody is produced in large amount. I mean if you look at a graph, is the antibody produced in large amount? Certainly not. Only 10 to the power of 1 arbitrary units within Within two weeks, you only have 10 to the power 1 arbitrary units. If you want a lot, it has to be a second exposure to antigen. So, it is not true for option C. For antibody to be produced in large amount is when the person is exposed to an antigen for the second time. Therefore, the answer is option D. If a person is re-exposed to a new antigen for the first time, 
another immune response is triggered because the person is re-exposed re to antigen B, which is a new antigen for the first time. So another immune response is triggered. Now let's look at um, a structure question or an essay question. Okay, so let's look at describe antigen antibody mediated mechanisms. Okay, what do you think? How would you phrase your answer? Correct, yes. In neutralization, antibodies block viral attachment sites or coats the bacterial toxin, making them ineffective to infect the whole cell. Phagocytic cells will eventually destroy the complex. And besides that, we have antibody mediated agglutination of bacteria and viruses deform aggregates that it simplifies for phagocytes to engulf the mass. And antibodies will bind to soluble antigens causing them to precipitate. This is the third um, and the last way of antibody antigen mediated mechanisms. These immobile precipitates are easily engulfed by phagocytes. So with that, um, that actually ends our very long lesson today about um, body defense mechanism and immunity. Thank you so much for watching ITTV. We hope you had a better understanding about how the body defenses itself as well as different types of immunity, passive and active as well as natural and artificial ways of acquiring immunity. So with that, I hope that you will practice a lot more of your questions. Thank you so much and have a great day.